was in the military uh, 1970 to 71. Uh, I was an E4, Specialist 4, and um, I was a MOS of a mortar man, and I later got a second MOS as a equipment operator, and went through the airborne school and became an airborne trooper, as they called us in those days, and spent uh, 13 months in Vietnam. Well, uh, <clears throat> I graduated from high school in 1969, and it just so happens in 1969 they had the first selective service lottery. And that lottery was to include all men that were born the years 1944 through 1950. December 31st, 1950. I was born December 3rd, 1950. So I managed to qualify for the lottery and it uh, involved drawing uh, 365 dates from a, a, a big glass bowl that was televised and each ball in the bowl had a, a date on it and my date was pulled in number 154. Just about any veteran that went through the draft at that time still remembers to this day what his draft number was because it became very key and crucial as to whether you were going to get the letter from the federal government inviting you to join the military. And so I went on to college after high school, I had a college deferment, but after three semesters I had begun to lose some hours and that qualified me for the draft so I was actually drafted right out of school. And fortunately, we came back and got to go back to school on the GI Bill. So I did get a big benefit from being drafted in the military. Uh, it's not a lot of interesting stories to be told from my perspective because I was more of a, I wasn't a rear echelon guy, I was a mortarman, but they wouldn't uh, allow me to be the guy that actually pulled the trigger on the mortar. I got to uh, hump the uh, shells from the armory over to the wire, as we call it, where the mortars were set up. And it was an interesting job, but eventually my CO got transferred and he took me with him. So we moved about uh, 200 miles south down to an area uh, near Saigon, from Cameron Bay down to Saigon. And so I performed lots of different jobs, from uh, driving trucks to pulling perimeter guard to um, did fly several uh, helicopter missions once I was down there because I was airborne. They put me in a helicopter as a door gunner and uh, that was probably the most interesting part of my job. So I really enjoyed that because you got the front row seat to see the entire countryside and the people and uh, you were at 1,500 feet and 90 miles an hour and it was just a good experience at that time if you could have a good experience. I guess I probably would like to discuss a little bit back home uh, because when I got drafted, <clears throat> the social unrest that was going on in our country, primarily amongst the younger people, um, was pretty severe. Uh, lots of demonstrations, uh, we, the older folks called us hippies and we gave the peace sign and uh, had a different philosophy about the way things should be done in our country, just like we do today, we have a different way of, of philosophy of doing things. And college campuses all over the country had demonstrations. There was a major demonstration in Washington, D.C. at the uh, Pentagon where 100,000 young men and women showed up to demonstrate against the war in Vietnam. They thought it was an unmoral war. and um, the drafting and conscription of Americans into the military was quite a big issue. There were a lot of young men that actually, rather than go into the military, uh, decided to go north to Canada. And many of them are still living in Canada today. Uh, so there was, there was a lot of things going on. And the war was different during that time. The military commanders, uh, were being given direction 
from members of Congress, the Defense Secretary, and the President of the United States at that time was President Johnson. And quite frankly, they were in Washington, D.C. They really didn't have a good handle on what was going on in Southeast Asia. <clears throat> and what they were doing was they were sending messages to the top command in Vietnam saying, we need good public relations. So it was a public relations effort from Washington so that the congressman would not look so bad in there because every day we did, our news source was from one place and it came on at 6 o'clock in the evening and it was called Walter Cronkite, the evening news. And so we had 30 minutes of news as opposed to today where you have 24-hour news stations, you have social media, all sorts of contact methods to get news. We got it once a day and the Vietnam War was the primary story almost every night with video of them uh, hauling out dead Americans and wounded Americans and it became very unpopular in our country. <clears throat> and the issue became that they, they decided to fight that war not by ground gained that we were familiar with, but how many people they could kill. And <clears throat> Vietnam uh, had the, the North Vietnamese Army, or the NVA as we call them, and then in the southern part of the country, we had the Viet Cong, or the VC, and the VC was really a guerrilla army. They wore no uniforms, they looked just like the civilian population, they might carry an AK-47 weapon, a bandolier of ammunition, a little sack of rice, and they would move through the jungles quietly and they were very effective. Whereas the NBA was a highly trained military force with uniforms and very disciplined. Uh, so I was so far south, we never had much contact with NBAs, but it was the Viet Cong that were the most feared because we couldn't tell them from the populace. They wore the very same clothes. And uh, so Washington dictated that they want to see who's winning the war by the number of people killed. Did we kill more of them than they kill of us? And the truth is we killed a lot more of them. Some numbers are as high as a million people that we killed there. And <clears throat> the, the idea was they wanted a daily body count. And that body count was not always accurate because they counted all the bodies. They couldn't tell if they were a VC or if they were a civilian. So the numbers are inflated, which suited Washington because they wanted to say we killed 10,000, they only killed 100 of us. So therefore we must be winning the war in Southeast Asia. Wasn't a great barometer of our success, to tell you the truth. And one of the jobs that I had was, uh, we had a fire base and that fire base was encircled with barbed wire and flares and we'd sit in a bunker all night long on guard duty. When the sun came up the next morning, our job was then to go outside the wire and count bodies from whatever went on the previous night. And my personal experience was, we would go in, in teams of four or five men. I count three bodies and I'd report it to my platoon sergeant and he would write down six. He reported to the company commander, he'd write nine down and so on and so forth all the way up through the battalion. And by the time it got to President Johnson's desk, the number may have been 156. So it's greatly exaggerated and greatly inflated and that was the scheme that Washington was using to try and keep the American thoughts and ideals of this war together because it was very unpopular and they were fighting the public relations uh, battle almost daily over that. So we lost 58,000 Americans, which does not include the Americans we lost when they came back home from the effects of Agent Orange or mental disorders, the wounded uh, were severely wounded. It was, it was hard to save limbs in that war. They were, they, they were very good at saving your life, 
but you came back without all your parts. And the mental disorders that ensued after that sort of thing, the veterans really did not have an avenue other than the VA, which is much different then than it is today. And there was not very much medical care uh, available for veterans during that time. And it became so unpopular, for some reason, Hollywood seems to be important politically when it comes to making public statements. And Hollywood was greatly against the war. There were lots of movies made, some for, some against. Uh, John Wayne made the Green Beret movie, and he personally chose only people of his political thinking to work on the movie. And that happened to be a pro-Vietnam movie. But there are several of them out there. Some are accurate, some are a stretch of the truth. Uh, but during this time, one of the Hollywood celebrities, Jane Fonda, a pretty well-known actress, made a trip to North Vietnam. And she was entertained by the North Vietnamese Army. And there was lots of photo ops of her sitting on an anti-aircraft uh, weapon uh, with a helmet on, a NBA helmet. And they took her to the Hanoi Hilton, where many of our POWs, a lot of them from Virginia Beach, were being held. And <clears throat> they were lined up, and she shook hands with each one. And several of the POWs, when they shook her hand, passed her a paper note that they had scratched out. And she did not read those notes that they passed to her. She simply turned around and handed them to the company commander, the camp commander, and he kept them. And upon her leaving the Hill, Hill, excuse me, Hanoi Hilton, he read the notes, identified who wrote them, and then tortured them for a week later. So they paid a severe price, and one of our Hollywood celebrities was the cause of it. So she's not been very popular, and some people like me still would not entertain any entertainment from Jane Fonda because of her actions. So uh, the, the social unrest that was going on along with the political uh, manipulation that was going on, it was pretty severe and some people even called it McNamara's War. It actually is officially called the Second Indochina War, which prior to the Americans arriving, the French were aiming to colonize the whole country of Vietnam and it erupted into civil war and eventually the French had to flee from the country. Robert McNamara was the Secretary of Defense during that particular period and he was the guy that was really demanding that the information, military information, was to be manipulated and he insisted that the uh, reports from Vietnam indicated that they had a standing army of 300,000 men. When the truth was, it was more than double or even triple. We're not sure what it was. He wanted that number to be low so that when the reports of military action killing people, Vietnamese, that it impacted that number greater than if it had been a million, if 3,000 were killed, it means a bigger impact if it's only 300,000 reported. And it was one of the biggest charades cast upon the American people, and it was all contrived in Washington, D.C. The information we were getting on the evening news we, we thought was accurate, but then we found out later it wasn't even close to being the truth. And it really was a, a unhappy time in America and the Vietnam War actually began in 1955 upon the French leaving, the American CIA began sending uh, advisors into the country to help the South Vietnamese government train their uh, armies and the Viet Cong as well. And as it, from 1955 till about 1962, there were uh, probably no more than 5,000 Americans in Vietnam. From 1962 forward, uh, the uh, escalation of the war demanded more and more military personnel. And in 1966, there was about 400,000 American soldiers in Vietnam. Uh, 
1968, the number had increased to over 500,000 American military people. So then that includes uh, military nurses, offshore blue water sailors, on the ground personnel in the U.S. Army or the U.S. Marine Corps. So it was a lot of military action going on and all that required a great deal of massive support to support, to feed, to clothe, to house all those troops in a hostile country. And it basically was our motivation as our country was, was to stem the tide of communism. Because during that period of time, the Cold War was roaring with the U.S. and Russia. And Russia was supplying the North Vietnamese with weapons, materiel, uh, rolling stock, even foodstuffs. And we were being supplied, obviously, by the military. And it became a, uh, another Cold War exercise. Uh, it, was, it was just devastating to our young men Women were not subjected to the draft, and they're still not today, as a matter of fact. The draft law is still in place. Every young man that turns 18 has 30 days to register for the selective service, even today. Um, but the, the idea was that we were populated with 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds, and 20-year-olds. And I was there for 13 months. I actually had two birthdays. I had my 20th birthday and my 21st birthday in Vietnam. Uh, the idea was to draft people that did not have a deferment, a college deferment. Then the criticism became that we were drafting the lower socioeconomic groups, the poorer people, the black folks from the inner cities who had no opportunity for a deferment. And that was mainly true where they were becoming a lower socioeconomic group. But there were many college graduates that went into the military because they lost their deferment at that particular time. But by and large, most people I met in my time there were just average citizens, uh, no particular background. You met people from Cincinnati, St. Louis, or Atlanta. It was just a mixed mash of, of various personalities and people that we all blended well together, but we all had a similar background. So the word at the time was if you were wealthy or if you had a silver spoon birthright, you didn't get to go in the military because you found a way to get a, dra a, dra a draft deferment. But once you're out of school, no longer had the deferment. The good news was we only had two draft lotteries and April of 1970 was the last dra draft lottery they had. And after that, it became an all-volunteer through 1975. And that was the end of the war for us. And everybody remembers the dramatic pictures of the helicopter landing on the, the uh, embassy in Saigon, uh, loading up the last few people that were left in the country. It, it was just a, a relief to leave that country. Whether we won the war or not, that still is to be debated. I got the feeling when I left there, we were not winning the war, and I'm pretty sure we didn't win the war. So my time off, I spent often over in an orphanage in uh, Saigon that was operated by the uh, French uh, nuns of the Catholic Church. And so I would often swipe uh, canned goods from our mess sergeant, load them up and take them over there to these, these nuns. These sisters were so dedicated to these orphans that uh, I just felt like we had to do something to help them. And they were so gracious and so appreciative. Uh, my buddy and I, we'd sometimes commandeer a truck and we'd take a whole truckload of goods over there. And they were in this orphanage they probably had a hundred children there from infants to six to seven to eight years old and they were all generally half American and you could tell they were half American by their features and uh, they were a social outcast during that time so that really gave me a, a, a rewarding feeling 
in a place that you didn't get many rewarding feelings. So I always look forward to helping the, the sisters out there whenever we could. Uh, but in the military, you meet some of the, the greatest people in the world, and I still remember them. I don't have contact with most of them. I still keep in contact with some. But you also meet some of the worst people in the world in the military. And it was a, an effort that nobody felt that we were winning the war. And unlike previous wars, when you were in the military, you, you were assigned there until the duration, until the war ended. In our case, we knew we were going to be there for 13 months. That was the standard tour. So when you got to be to month 10 or month 11, your attitude changed. All you wanted to do was get out of there and get home. So the, the productivity levels dropped off considerably and it wasn't, run, it wasn't a military run like it was where we may be more familiar with a World War II or a Korean type military operation. It was, uh, it was an unusual time. The, the hippies, as they called them, were, were leading the way and morally people at home and in Vietnam were against the war and it was just a political fight to try and win the battle of the public relations business. One of my primary jobs was uh, I was assigned to a Huey air crew. Uh, the Hueys are the most familiar helicopters in Vietnam and were, really, were the workhorses of it. And we had a four-man crew, we had a pilot, a co-pilot, a door gunner and a crew chief who was also the door gunner on the other side. I was a member of that group as a door gunner and we were assigned to a signal brigade that was actually running a, or burying a rather large telephone cable to establish communications from further up north down to the south. And the operation to lay the cable was bulldozers clearing jungle and they would plow it into the ground about three or four feet below the surface. And our job was to simply orbit around that operation uh, because we had a bird's eye view, although it may be just pure jungle, you can't see if anybody's down there, but we were there flying support for that uh, particular signal group that were laying the cables. And one particular day, we listened on their radio, and we could hear them on the ground saying they were catching uh, incoming fire from the jungle line that, that where they had cleared the, with the bulldozers just inside the wood line. And <clears throat> we could not see anything. We even dropped down into the 200 to 400 foot range, could not see them. But then we began taking fire as we got down lower. And so they gathered around and, and rallied up on the entire crew. We called in a couple of extra helicopters because we couldn't carry them all out of there. But when we came in for a landing, to, we could take out six men at a time, uh, which gave us a load of 10 people on the helicopter, which was pretty much at the design limits of the helicopter. When we lowered in there, the fire was rather fierce. My job was they were down low and I was to fire about seven to eight feet above their heads and suppressing fire. The military term was uh, su uh, superior firepower. That's how they thought we would win the war. And that was our job. We, we basically laid down superior firepower to keep them, keep their heads down while we gathered these troops in and into our helicopter. Well, they came running out of the jungle towards us and as each one stepped on the runner to come in, I would reach my hand out and pull him into the cabin and all the while keeping my left hand on my weapon so that I could keep that suppressing fire going. And when these guys got in and we lifted off quickly and peeled away from that particular area, they were uh, pretty wet, muddy and bloody and sweating profusely. It was just like 110 degrees that day. and after I had ran through about four ammo boxes, uh, I s turned my barrel of my weapon around and I looked at these guys, I said, any of you have a cigarette? And one of them fished me out a cigarette and I lit it off the barrel of my weapon because it was cherry red from so many rounds going through it. And they just had big eyes looking at it. So they were pretty happy to get out of that particular piece of the jungle. And we left all our equipment there and of course,
course, we came back the next day and it was not the same place that we left yesterday, but they had disabled the equipment before we had to leave in such a hurry. So they picked it up in a week and kept right on laying cable and we kept flying security from up above and finally got that cable all the way into Saigon so they had telephone communications. Oh.